Oh, good morning, guys. I'm so glad to see you. So glad to see a lot of new faces. I, I got lots of text and, and Facebook messages last week um, from moms saying, oh, we weren't, I'm not able to be there this week, but I can't wait for next week. So I know there's several um, new moms here. And I would encourage you to listen to the podcast because I feel like last week was kind of um, your introduction into what you're what you're enlisting in, as we like to say around here at Moms with Swords. If you are here, we kind of consider you enlisting in this army of front lines. Um, the picture of us moms uniting together to run to the Goliaths that are coming at our children. And all you have to do is watch the news and you will see that there are lots of Goliaths that are coming. I actually dreamed the other night that ISIS had taken my John William. I, seriously, but I remember going to this garage to pick him up and they surrendered him to me. I was in my van. I remember pushing the button to start. They raised the, the garage, but yet they were bringing another somebody out and putting on their black stuff. So I, I was in a panic and I made the mistake of telling my third child who is the judge, the fair person and the worrier that I dreamed this. So all week long, he's like, mom, ISIS is really far away, right? <laughs> So, um, but there are lots of Goliaths coming at our children. So if you are here, you are saying, no way, no trespassing on my babies because I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight just as David did. All right, let's jump right in. Chapter one, raising our children. Chapter one, raising our children to look through either a mirror or a window. Which do you see yourself, as you read through this chapter, which do you see yourself holding up for your children to look through? Some of the examples that she shared truly arrested my heart with just how what my kids look through is on me. What your kids are looking through, moms, is on you. Now we know that re the responsibility and ultimately the direction that our children are going to go in life is in the hands of an all-knowing, all-sovereign, all-good God that works everything for good. But moms, the foundation and the groundwork we lay at home is so very vital. God likes people to work through. Jeremiah 29 11, you all could quote it, for I know the, and we're going, we're going, we're going to go to, we're going to go there in a couple weeks. So God has a plan, right, for your children and for you. He has a plan, but he needs somebody to execute that plan through. And guess what? It's your job. It's not your youth group. It's not that amazing school. It is not their grandparents. That job, moms, is on you. We play a huge role in whether our kids will look through a mirror or a window. Like I've said many times, there are some families that get lucky. Some of you probably know some moms, some, some dads that have kids that were never taken to church, that were never had a Bible spoken over them, that were never introduced, never listened to a lick of Christian music, and those kids are great. But I'm going to tell you something. Here at Moms with Swords, we do not depend on luck. We're not basing on luck that our kids are going to love and serve God. We are banking on the word of God that we moms are speaking over our children, that we moms are planting in the hearts of our kids. I got a text over Christmas from one of my leaders, one of um, a mom here that had been praying for her daughter to receive Jesus. And she was, she came to me last session. She's like, Joy, I just, I'm so anxious. I'm so anxious. And I'm like, you just keep planting. You just keep planting. Let God lead her. So she texted me over Christmas and she said, Joy, Chloe gave her heart to Jesus. And I said, Crystal, it's because of your planting. It is a result of what you're doing at home. Yes, God is the one that draws the heart. But moms, you can't just, just, let him, just let him be out there doing all the work. He needs you. 
What you do at home is vital. You are not just a stay-at-home mom. You are a spiritual warrior for your children. So the next time somebody looks at you and says, oh, I get that a lot. Oh, so you're just a stay-at-home mom? I say, no, I get to be a spiritual warrior for my children. What do you do? <laughs> what do you do? And that usually gets some really interesting looks. But moms, what you are planting, what you are doing at home matters, and it is vital. And God's plan that he's already put forth in heaven, he needs you to execute that plan. To give you a picture of how vital and how important good and bad a mother's influence is, I want you to go with me to Genesis chapter 27. Moms, your influence in the home, have you ever thought about how powerful your influence is? Do you ever watch your children interact with other children and go, oh my gosh, that's me? <laughs> Do you ever hear your 10-year-old holler at her 7-year-old brother and you go, oh gosh, that's what I do? <laughs> your influence is vital and it is powerful. Moms, we've got to use it wisely. Genesis chapter 27, verse 5. We're going to read all the way to 14. Genesis 27, verse 5. Rebecca was listening while Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game to bring home, Rebecca said to her son, who happened to be her favorite son, Jacob, Behold, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau, saying, Bring me some game and prepare a savory dish for me, that I may eat and bless you in the presence of the Lord. Underline that word, that I may eat and bless you. Underline bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Verse 8, Now therefore, my son, listen to me as I command. Moms, that word command in the original Hebrew text means set in order. So Rebecca is telling Jacob, I've set this in order. Go, obey it. So she had already set this in order. Go, my son, listen to me as I command, as I command you. Verse 9, go now to the flock and bring me two choice young goats from there that I may prepare them as a savory dish for your father, such as he loves. Then you shall bring it to your father that he may eat, underline this, so that he may bless you before his death. Verse 11, Jacob answered his mother, Rebekah, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, then I will be a deceiver in his sight, and I will bring upon myself a curse and not a blessing. Verse 13, but his mother said to him, Your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go get them for me. Verse 14, so he went. Jacob did what I have put into place in our home. He obeyed right away the first time. He, so he obeyed right away, all the way, and with a happy heart. Anybody else have that in their house? Yeah, I love that. So Jacob, he obeyed right away, all the way, and maybe with a happy heart, maybe like, oh, are you sure, Mama? But he obeyed tricked his father. Do you see the power mothers hold? She was so desperate for her favorite son Jacob to get his father's blessing. The father's blessing in this time of the firstborn was a huge deal. It was said a double portion would go to them whoever the firstborn was and got the father's blessing. He would also, it was said, inherit his father's role of authority in the family. So Rebecca was desperate for her favorite son to have this. She wanted him to have a blessing. She wanted him to be happy. As we see on down in verse 27, 29, the blessing was Isaac blessed Jacob 
with prosperity, with dominion, and with protection. Happiness, happiness, happiness. No problems for my favorite son. I want you to get that blessing. I want you to be happy. So I'm willing for you to trick your father to get it. So what are you willing to do for your children to be happy? I was in Publix not too long ago where shopping is a pleasure. Stephanie Swanson, but it's not cheap. Where's Stephanie? Oh, um, I know, BOGO, I get that. Um, I was in Publix, and I was checking out, and I was behind this, this cart of little, little ones. I don't even know. My kids are getting so old. Everybody looks little. So maybe two, three-year-olds. And this mom, in her hand, had a box of donuts that were opened and almost all gone. <laughs> And I just thought, I guess she had used the donuts to make her shopping experience a pleasure. <laughs> As the kids' mouths were just drenched with chocolate sprinkles and everything. Who has done that? Go ahead, admit it. Uh -huh, I've done it too. So in essence, this mom was trying to keep her child happy so she could shop. What I want you to see in the lens of Scripture, what God revealed to me in such conviction through the lens of Scripture, is that we need moms. It's on us. We have got to teach our children that you, my child, are blessed and highly favored regardless if you are happy. You are blessed, my child. You are highly favored, my child, whether or not you are happy. This word happy probably makes you all think of, and I'm happy, clap along if you feel like happiness is the truth. You know that song, right? Pharrell. He, he's not far off in the world's eye of happiness. <clears throat> Happy in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary means this, enjoying or marked by pleasure, satisfaction, joy, characterized by good luck. That's happiness, and if you watch the Grammys, I believe you saw a picture of that. I'm happy because I have pleasures, because I have satisfaction. I've had a lot of good luck. But happiness through the lens of Scripture is rooted in something much deeper, something that surpasses whether or not we are happy. Something that surpasses whether or not we are satisfied or have joy or have pleasure. Happiness in the scripture has nothing to do with luck, but everything to do with a Savior. Now look at happy in the Greek. Very different. Happy in the New Testament Greek comes from the word makarios, M-A-K-A-R-I-O-S. Now there are several forms of this word, but the tenses all mean the same thing. What this means is happy, blessed, as the result of enjoying the benefits that literally extend from God. This tense, Mac, M-A-K, means, listen to this, to become long and large. God extending. Listen, to be envied. So to me, moms, we can say, based upon Scripture, to be happy 
in Jesus. To be happy is a direct result of enjoying the benefits that come from God that are too large to ever see them as small and too long to run ever run out of. That's happiness in the lens of Scripture. We are a direct, it's a direct result of enjoying the benefits that come from God that are too large to ever see as small and too long to ever run out of. Ephesians 3.18, may you have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, verse 19, and to know the love of God which surpasses knowledge, which surpasses happiness, pleasure, and satisfaction satisfaction which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God's moms if we buy into this if we grasp as Paul says if we comprehend and this is where our happiness lies then our little parents that mimic what we do theirs will lie there more than likely if we buy into this, that, the happy, that happiness in the scripture lens is blessed as the result of enjoying the benefits that literally extend from God, our kids will buy into that. Are you holding that up to your kids? So we saw the meaning of this word makarios. I want you to see this word broken down in another scripture reference. In the very famous Beatitudes or Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. Now, I, I, I did a little bit of research on the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes, this term, Beatitude, comes from a Latin noun, which means happiness. And as we're fixing to read in a minute, these aren't real happy declarations that God's given. But the beatitude word comes from this Latin noun means happiness. There is an actual church in Israel called the Church of the Beatitudes. It is erected on the site, possibly across from where Jesus would have given the Sermon on the Mount. Now, the Beatitudes, there's a lot of um, disgruntledness as to when they actually happen because, but I, what I, I'm going to go with this because I read this, and, but there's lots of arguments. So it might not be fact, but there, there is an, uh, an argument that the Beatitudes happen right in the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And as I read through the Beatitudes, I thought, this should be the first thing Christians, after they accept Christ, need to read. Because it's kind of setting you up for the world you live in. And if you get this and what this word means and what the divine results are at the end of, this, of, of, the, of these Beatitudes, man, you're gonna, I think you're going to walk different. So it, it, they come right after Jesus comes out of the wilderness and he, it says he goes and he, it, his disciples come to him and he sits. He has just called his 12, which I love. So the Beatitudes were meant, they were meant for all who acknowledged Jesus as king, but he delivered them, addressed them to his 12. I love that he addressed them to his 12 because based on where they, what they would endure after this teaching... I think God was setting them up. That yeah, all these things are gonna happy, but let, gonna happen. But let me tell you what's what is gonna be because of the result of that. So I want us to read these beatitudes, seeing this in the lens of that word makarios. Now, if you look up this word in the Greek, you're gonna see these two words that I left out of the definition when I gave it to you earlier. Makarios. It says, supremely blessed. Write that down. So as I read through these Beatitudes, and when we break them down, remember those two words, supremely blessed. All right, let's read. Matthew chapter 5, let's start in verse 1. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him. Don't you believe they just were hungry? He had just told them that they were going to be fishers of men. So they're just like, teach me. He began to teach them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Verse 12, rejoice and be glad. Because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way you, they persecuted the prophets before you. So Jesus is saying, blessed, before all of these, these terms. Okay, so now let's break them down. Verse 3. Jesus tells his twelve and the crowd surrounding them, blessed. What did I tell you the two words to remember? Supremely Blessed. So Jesus says in verse 3, supremely blessed are the poor. That word poor, pauper, or beggar. Supremely blessed are the paupers and the beggars. Verse 4, he says, supremely blessed are those who mourn. That word mourn means to grieve or wail. Some of you mamas have done that over children. I've had two miscarriages. I have been in that state of grieving and wailing. God says, supremely blessed are you. Verse 6, supremely blessed are you who hunger. That means famished. He says in verse 6 again, Blessed are you who are thirsty. That means it thirst, thirst. They're thirsty. Supremely blessed. Jump down to 10. He says, supremely blessed are you who are persecuted. That word means pursued. Anybody ever felt pursued? God says you're supremely blessed. Verse 11, and this happens, I hate to admit it, but it, 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 it's my struggle. I do not like it when people think something about me or think they know something about me that is not truth, when they utter untruth or when they think something that is not true. So Jesus is saying, Joy, supremely blessed are you when you are falsely accused. That word, utter untruth or persecute. I don't like that. Happened to me this week. As I was writing and preaching this message to my dog, Toby. <laughs> Those of you who know, I preach my message a lot of times, I do. And t my dog gets saved every time I preach it. <laughs> Little Toby. Verse 12, look at this. This, this. this is amazing. Okay, so verse 12, Jesus says, rejoice and be glad. That word, rejoice, means be well. God speed, hail, joy. So Jesus is telling these disciples, hail, joy when you're persecuted and you're thirsty and you're hungry. He says, be glad. Jump for joy. In the midst of your mourning, do you feel like jumping for joy? Not usually. But he's saying jump for joy. Verse 12, he says, for great is your reward. That word great, listen what it means in the Greek. That word great is polos. P-O-L-O-S. It says much, abundant, plentiful, far past. Moms, your mourning, your hunger, your wailing, your not liking to be falsely accused is, is going to reap much abundance, plenteous, and it's going to be far past. One more example of this same word, makarios, in 1 Peter 3, 14. He says, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. What does it mean? Supremely blessed because of the blessings that literally extend from God. 
and do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. Moms, this blessed, this happy comes from a deeper place. This happy supersedes disappointment. It supersedes loss. It overrides the tantrums. This happy from the Beatitudes in the Greek is a happiness that comes from a soul that knows they are favored by God because he is pledging you divine rewards because of it. Whether you're happy or not, moms, we can teach this to our children. No, we get to teach this to our children. Just yesterday, as I was literally third or fourth time through my message, I get a text from my 13-year-old. I get a text from Sydney that says, Mom, because I could read the tone. <laughs> you got to come get me. Now, Wednesday, put this in your full front of your, of your mind. Wednesday is FCA day. Mom, you got to come get me. There's so much drama. There's so much drama. People are starting rumors about my, my friends, and you just got to come get us. You got to come get us. As I'm just now preaching to myself about my kids, you know, being happy, you don't always get to be happy. So I text Sydney back and I said, I'm not coming to get you. I'm not rescuing you. I'm not fighting for you right now. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to fight in prayer for you. But you stand up and you fight. Send her that text. I go on, finish my message, go up to take a shower. She calls me. Mom, you got it. Listen, this, listen, this is hilarious. So they're, we're in the counselor's office. There's like five of us. Will you come get us so you can pray over us? I said, in my mind, I, the Lord quickened me. I said, Sydney, tell me about FCA. She said, Mom, Coach Tucker called on me and asked me if I would come and speak. And Mom, I gave an altar call. I about jumped off my balcony. I said, Sydney Chambly, praise God. The enemy is so mad right now. I said, you put me on speakerphone. I am going to pray. I'm not coming up to this middle school, but I'm going to pray right now. Y'all, we teach our children, we get to model this for our children, that their happiness does not come from their circumstances. Their happiness comes in spite of their circumstances. Because the length of their father's blessings on their lives, we have to shift their focus back to that. Sure, you're not going to be happy. Sure, you're going to be pursued. But your happiness does not lie in what you see. Your happiness lies in what I am planting in you night after night, day after day. I don't care if your babies, y'all, I had a mom. I spoke over at Burnt Hickory last week. I about, again, I about shouted at, before I even spoke. I had a mom come up. She is a two and a half year old and a six month old. And she said, I just want you to know what happened after you spoke last time. She said, you, what God spoke through you lit a fire in me. And do you know that my two and a half year old knows several books of Psalms by memory? She said, I called my husband when I got in that car and I said, no more. I don't care that they're two and a half. I don't, she said, and so now when I nurse, I just speak scripture over my baby. Moms, it is not ever, ever, ever too late if your kids are older. It is never too early if your kids are babies. Start planting, start speaking, start pouring your babies. Bathe them in the word of God. It works, it works. And they will have um, a window instead of a mirror. We went to the Belt Bowl over New Year's Eve. Um, Georgia was playing, I don't even know this group. And this is a really big point of contention for my husband because we are Tennessee fans. But our mentors and our very, very like close, close friends, their son, Michael Bennett, number 82 on the Georgia football team, plays. So Todd even had to throw up in his mouth and wear black and red. <laughs> it was hilarious. He was so mad. So 
we, we get to go to the belt bowl and little John William, again, I just, I bought him Georgia Crocs and my husband's kicking us out of the house. Todd's like, what are you doing? So John William is a huge Georgia fan now. So Michael Bennett was going to take him and we were going to go back to the hotel after this game. And John William was going to get to meet all these players and, and all, you know, it was so exciting. So we were, we were going to the belt bowl. So we, Beth and I, um, Michael's mother, were riding down there and Michael sends us a text or sends his mom a text and says, Mom, will y'all please pray for me? Will you please pray that God will keep me protected? This would be Michael's last game as a Georgia Bulldog. That night, Michael was going to go and, and meet with his agent and get him ready and paper signed to send him off to a camp that would then take him to the NFL Combine. So this was a big game. So Michael was like, y'all pray. So woo, we were praying. I, I had just done a teaching on favor. Because moms, look, I'm not, I'm not up here preaching to you that we need to pray our kids get persecuted and are hungry and are pursued. No, uh-uh. We're running to those Goliaths. But we're learning right now today that in spite of all that stuff, they are still favored of God. And we're still praying that. So we were praying the favor of God for Michael. Even a car cut in front of me, I didn't even want to be mad at him because they had favor, literally a bumper sticker that said favor on the back of their car. So before I blew the horn, <laughs> I saw that bumper sticker. I was like, oh! So we just knew, oh my gosh, we knew God was going to favor Michael. This is going to be his best game ever. So we get there, and John William is like this far from Todd Gurley, and he couldn't wait because he was going to get to go meet all these players. I got to sit by Nick Chubb's mama, and she quickly knew, Pam, that I know nothing about football. I'm like, did they, try, did they audition for, to be on this team? I mean, I know nothing, nothing. So Nick Chubb's mom was laughing. She was really making fun of me, which you totally can't because I know nothing about the game. So we, it was so fun. John William was just like, oh, my gosh. And every time Michael would go to make a pass, I could hear Beth. She just praying. Woo, she was praying. Lord, just, you know, and so he caught it. So it was halftime. It was freezing. Oh, my gosh, freezing. So we go into the bathroom to get warm, and we're talking, just sharpening. Beth is my mentor, personal mentor, and everything she says, I'm just like, you know. So she's sharpening me, and we're talking, and we hear Michael Bennett's name over the loudspeaker, and we just run out. And the game had started back for the third period, quarter, quarter. See, period basketball. Periods are basketball. <laughs> Dana, you know that. So the third quarter had started, and Michael's fiance, when we got down there, Michael's fiance was white. And she looked at Beth and said, He grabbed his knee when he went down. So Todd is talking to John, and we're there. John hops over the thing and goes down to the locker room. And worst case scenario happens Michael has torn his ACL. Worst case scenario was going to sign papers to go to a camp to go to the NFL Combine that night. So as you can imagine, the mood changed and we're trying to tell our seven-year-old that when Michael gets in the van, he's not going to want lots of pictures with you. He's not going to be happy. So we get the van and pull around and Michael comes out on his crutches and I'm sitting in the back. So Michael gets in and Beth, his mother, gets in beside him. And if I could describe the way he looked, it was literally just mourning over his face. And when his mother would look at him, big tears would just well up. She was mourning more than he was over his mourning. It was the death, possibly, of a dream. And this mother, who has taught her boy to look through a window, was facing the worst case scenario. One of the daughters, Michael's sisters, calls Beth, and, and I just am kind of I'm so distraught over just the situation and, and just the emotions of the whole night. And, and I hear Beth on the phone talking to her daughter, and she says, yes, I know, but even in this, God is still good. Moms, 
Did Michael's circumstances dictate whether or not he was happy? No. Michael's circumstances were bad. But in that moment, the very next morning, Michael's tweet was, and I quote, another torn ACL and another chance to respond to adversity. God is in control. Michael Bennett has spoken five times since that injury at churches. Michael in that moment was not happy. But Michael had had something planted in him that he knew in spite of whether or not my circumstances are producing pleasure or happiness, it is not marked by that because my happiness comes from the blessings that extend from God. Moms, your children are going to be persecuted. Your children are going to be looked over. Your children are going to suffer. But it doesn't matter because God says great is their reward abundant far past is their reward moms do you understand that we get to teach our children that in the moment of the greatest disappointment of their life they can look through a window the goal in your homes moms is not happy kids the goal in your home is holy kids that know whether or not they are happy. They are still blessed and they are still favored by a God that sent his son to die for them. You get to hold that up to your children every day. Every day. So what will, you, what will you hold today, this afternoon, when it gets hard? You're probably going to hold a mirror up sometimes. I do it. But let's choose today to hold that window up that says, child of mine, you are happy because of your father's blessings on your life. Let's pray. God, I thank you that our happiness is not dictated by our, so our circumstances, Lord. That our happiness is not dictated by whether we feel pleasure or satisfaction, God. Our children's happiness is not embedded in the fact of whether everything is going the right way. They make the right team. They get an A. They get the right teacher. God, our children's happiness, God, is rooted in the fact that you are still good and loving in spite of if none of that happens. May we moms, God, model this to our children. May we see the power that we hold and may we model this to our children. May we make it a goal, God, to have holy kids that are rooted deep in the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen.